LinkedIn presents. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Welcome, everybody, to the first live edition of Marketing Today with Alan Hart. Today on the show, I've got Amitra Mathur. She's the VP of Marketing at Superside. And when she joined Superside as their first marketing hire in 2019, there was no product, no platform, and no recurring revenue. She's no stranger to being called in when companies are at a strategic inflection point with their growth strategy. And she did what she spent a career in B2B marketing learning how to do, which was implement a marketing-led growth strategy that translated into $8 million in subscription revenue in the first year and 400% year-over-year growth since then. She's now, as VP of Marketing, her team is revolutionizing design at scale for ambitious brands like Amazon, Meta, Shopify, and Coinbase. So, Amitra, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. That was some intro. You should talk to my (laughs) boss. Like he needs to know this. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, before we get talking about you and business and um, pathway to becoming CMO at Superside, I hear you have quite the appreciation for what we would call quote unquote community. And Mm. I'd love to hear a little more about that. I mean, I, I think, listen, I think this term has been thrown around a lot. And I think that it means different things to different people and there's community building. And then there's this sense of community. And really what I'm talking about is like this sense of community. And for me, I just, the pseudonym for it, like the the closest facsimile I've come up with is just this idea of goodwill. It's a very simple concept, but a, a community of people, customers, prospects, the market at large, whatever you want to think about, that community of people within your aura, within your network, around the company, the halo of the company, and everyone having some level of goodwill for the company because of perhaps what you have given them is how I think about community. And I think that the value of the community is, it it could be anything. So it could be everything from, hey, how do I leverage this product better, right? That's like a very direct line of sight which is obvious. And how do I leverage this product better? How do I be better at my job? Those are obvious ones. But then how do I grow my skills? How do I grow my career? That's a selfish desire that a community could tap into. And the third more nebulous one, which perhaps is the most nuanced, and this might come come out the wrong way, but it's like this idea of like, people feeling like, damn, I have people in my corner. I have someone in my corner. I have this company or I have like this slew of people, whether they work at this company or other people in the community, whatever it is, having people in your corner. And like that can have like a profound emotional impact. I think consumer companies know this really well, but I I don't know that B2B companies think about this quite as often as we should. So, and and to me, that's community. It's this, this is like, Famous statistic. I follow a few psychologists on my Instagram, so I see this all the time. But I think the leading cause of early death or what, what's the word? Health span, declining health span or lifespan is this idea of loneliness. We've all heard the statistics around the loneliness thing. But if you actually like break that down further of what loneliness is, it's this idea of not having a community, not having people in your corner, not having someone thinking about you and checking in on you or what have you. That, if you just take that and translate it to business, translate it to marketing, that can be profound for your company. And if you could look at all your marketing through that lens in theory. So I'm not, I'm not a super expert and I don't know that I've figured out all the pieces, but at least that's the higher order thinking I'm trying to do and instill on the team. No, I, I love it. I love it. And I think, I mean, I think the pandemic in particular took this to a whole nother level for me as well. If I think about that, I mean, we were so isolated by design, right? We had to, to some degree, unless you were in the bubble with other friends, right? <laughs> we all had some friends. And, and lots of people found community through those bubbles. Like I have, exactly. I know acquaintances of mine who have entirely new friend groups, people that I've never met before, 
like now I go to their house for like a party and I'm like, who are these people? But they're like their pandemic friends. Like they even refer to each other as their pandemic friends. That's so, true. Yeah, I, I see the value in that so much. I mean, just uh, slightly off topic, but I had a situation with when my daughter was born. Hmm. And she was in the hospital, like life and death situation. She was in the hospital for like quite a while. And when when you're in that type of situation and your friends and family know, yeah, like you expect obviously like support. Obviously I expected that. But man, the outpouring of support. And I heard from people I had never, I hadn't talked to like in years. I even had this aunt who I don't really like, who I was like, <laughs> like this like weird catty person who was like in my corner and she had pulled together. She's like part of this meditation group. She had pulled together this group of people. They were meditating with my daughter's photo in front of them the whole time for like days, days and days and days and wow. all this stuff. And she, my daughter pulled through. They, she, they didn't have to do surgery on her brain or anything like that. And the top brain surgeon in Canada, which, which is where I am, said that this is a miraculous recovery with no intervention. Mm. He's like, I literally have not seen this in my career. And it's amazing. And I'm like my little five pound baby, like she pulled through slightly premature and she did all this. And I think so much of it was what we just like laugh and say, oh, good vibes. But that's community. It's, I know this is like hocus pocus for some people, but like there's, there's something to be said about goodwill and energy. And yeah, just need to curate Mm. that a bit more. No, I, I'm a hundred percent believer in the collective community and the fact that one action leads to another. Like our universe is too interconnected for that not to be the case, right? Yeah. Depending on no matter what you believe, physics should be able to prove that that's the case. Totally. String theory, <laughs> symmetry, all of that stuff that's all yeah. theoretical. Yeah. Maybe one day we'll be like, ooh, okay, these dots are connecting. All right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know it's very personal, but I love the the underline in terms of what the community component means to you. I'd love to talk a little bit about your career path. Like where where did you get your start? And then how did you end up as the VP of marketing at SuperSci? Yeah, um, not like unlike other people. I think there's a lot of marketers. I mean, I, I have a lot of marketing friends myself and Every, no one really started in marketing. That's the, no one went to school for marketing. You know, like I, I think I'd be hard pressed to find someone that went to school for marketing and is actually like a damn good marketer. I can't think of a single example, actually. So yeah, similar to those folks, um, just started off elsewhere. Like I have a very like sort of a computer science technical degree. I was a developer when I first started, hated it. There was like, this is also back in the day, right? Like this is like 20 years ago, almost. There's no paired programming. All we had was like Java and C++. Like we didn't have Ruby, didn't have React. Facebook wasn't around. Like this is a whole whole different ballgame. So hated that. And then just like slowly transitioned to marketing. And I remember like one of my first jobs when I moved to Canada from India was I joined this tech company. It was like the lowest, like that was like the June, the most junior, most marketing person you can be. So lowest on the totem pole. But marketing automation was new and hot. And everyone was like, what is this thing? Oh my gosh. And wow, you can automate like emails and this and that. And I was put in charge of looking at all the vendors, which there was like three of, and like figuring out what to buy and how to implement it and how we're going to leverage it. And that was so empowering and so crazy. I was, I remember still to this day thinking like, okay, I'm in the right place. This is awesome. This is the perfect blend of like science and data and like qual and, and like really understanding buyer psychology and all of this together, all in one place to make this thing successful. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. This is cool. So yeah, I just kind of like fell into it and this big event happened in the world and I just happened to be at the right place, right time. And that just cemented like my path. And then I, I remember also thinking like, okay, what do I need to be to be like a good marketer? Like what, what are the skills I need to learn to be a good marketer? And I always wanted to be this like all rounder person. Like I didn't want to just like, I think, I think there was like lots of conflicting advice always as, as always, right. It's like, Oh, become a specialist, go deep in an area and, you know, nail that. And I always kind of had this like sort of polymath outlook, like, Oh, you should be good at sort of everything. And I wanted to be this good generalist. Hmm. And yeah, that as it turns out is actually pretty good ingredient list to running a marketing team and building a GTM function, which I didn't think about it quite as deliberately, but turns out it works out. It works in your favor as if you want to climb the ladder, so to speak. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so let's talk a little bit about what SuperSide does. Like what is the company? What do you guys do? Who do you serve? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So Superside is a design subscription company and we we essentially serve marketing and creative teams and help them unbottleneck their design challenges and getting creative done in a fast and efficient manner. So I think our whole shtick, unlike an agency, unlike a freelance or marketplace or any internal design team, which everybody has one these days, is to like be like a bit of a point solution on a couple of key problems inside the company. So it might be hey, we're a marketing team that's like super reliant on, let's say, performance marketing to acquire customers. Great. How do we 10x that? How do we create, how do we experiment and feed into like the feedback loop? How do we make standout creative that actually lowers your CAC, right? That's an example of a point solution. Or it could be, oh, I want to try to crack a new channel from from a social standpoint. Maybe it's TikTok, maybe it's YouTube. Okay, those are very high intensity video platforms. You actually need the algorithms reward consistency. So how do you now suddenly crack YouTube? Okay, you're going to have to stand up a video team and an editing team. How are you going to do that? Okay, no, wait, Superside is a great point solution to help you do that. And it's, it's, very, it's a very scalable solution. So yeah, we're, we're a design subscription company. We've kind of invented a new category, if you will, although we don't like to think about it like that, but it's a solution that's different than the typical ways to, the incumbent ways to get design done today, which is usually through your own internal team, or some augmented support through an agency, or some augmented support through a freelancer, which has a lot of hassles and overhead and project management. So it's a fully managed design subscription service for marketing and creative teams. Nice. And and so is it, the notion is like, I can go into, once I have a subscription, I go in and superscribe, ask for help or support, maybe fill out some information, and then I get, uh, start working with a team or a group of folks. Exactly. In a repeatable manner. So like given we would have had a conversation before you signed up for the subscription about Mm -hmm. like where the bulk of your needs lie and what the main challenges are and what the main OKRs are, et cetera, that you're trying to drive. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, we assemble like this, like all-star team with all the right skill sets and capabilities. It's a double-sided onboarding. You know, we onboard you guys to Superside. um, Superside obviously gets onboarded to the brand and their goals and whatever else. And then, yeah, and then it's go time. So in theory, like I always give this example because it's literally happened to me. CEO is going on a keynote at South by Southwest or whatever. And you're yeah. like, holy shit, I need some new media or I need a kick kick ass video to open this whole thing with. You could like go into super space. We call the back end the super space. You go into super space. Customer could be like at 3 a.m. Like, oh my God, I need a video for like tomorrow morning. And because like the CEO is going on stage at 2 p.m. or what have you. Like <laughs> in theory, like you could wake up in the morning and that first draft of the video is in your inbox. So we really optimize for efficiency and speed and scale. So like what that does for particularly for fast growing ambitious companies is to say, Hey, our plans change all the time based on the experiments that we run. And so, no, we're not going to have this like perfect, there's no perfect roadmap for creative projects. And so, yeah, we are going to be changing our minds every single month. And like, we need a team that can roll with that. And so that's the beauty of the tech and the service and the operating model that we've built. It's, it's, it's for, a certain dynamic. It's not for everybody. If you if you're like, hey, I need to update my brand identity, and you do that <laughs> once in two years, yeah, go find an agency. That's great. Or you're or hey, you're Coca Cola. You're launching vitamin water in Brazil, right? It's a campaign that right. you've thought about for two years. That's the planning cycle. Great, amazing. Another agency will help you with that. That's cool. That that's fine. That's not the super side use case. Gotcha, gotcha. And I mean, it it's obviously working. We talked a little bit about the growth in your intro, but I think it, if I've got my numbers right, it's four years. You've gone from zero to somewhere around fifty five million dollars in annual recurring revenue. I mean, that doesn't happen just by luck. How'd that happen? Yeah, I ask myself that every day. <laughs> Some of it feels <laughs> surreal. No, the growth's been really good. I think that we did a couple of things well, and then a couple of things were like definitely like amazing timing, right? Like the pandemic really helped us in some ways because screen time went up, people were spending more time on like their digital platforms, both from a consumer standpoint, but also companies and spend on paid and whatnot went up. So I kind of feel like there were some tailwinds that we got from the pandemic, and I can talk a bit more about that. But there's a couple of things that we did right that I think were that were like foundational and maybe we didn't quite know how that would pan out, but it it did in retrospect, it really did. So one of the key things was we knew from day one early on that we really needed to figure out our differentiation from all the other incumbent solutions there are to get design done today, because the problem is pretty well understood. 
It's just right. that there's so many players in that space. Like, oh, design. Oh, yeah, I could be like a random designer. And, and you know, often people have this idea of like, you just hire like one guy and somehow he has like this amazing <laughs> skill set and he can do everything from motion graphics to animation, right. to illustration, to graphic design and spruce up your slide decks. Like, you know, there's no such person, right? But no. I don't think everyone knows that. So yeah, dispelling a lot of the myths, differentiating like crazy, being very focused on a couple of use cases, being very focused on a couple of buyer personas. That was like the early game. It's like, we just tried to go as deep as possible on that. And I'd say like the second thing, which I think is missing in B2B today. And again, consumer companies know this, but I don't think B2B company knows this is like, we invested in marketing in a big way since day one. And Mm -hmm. I think there was this like very clear notion from the CEO that we want to build an efficient machine. We don't want to do the usual, like throw bodies at the problem, have really high revenue mm-hmm. per employee or really low level revenue per employee because there's so many bodies floating around. You know, like a, a lot of B2B companies start with like, hey, we don't really have product market fit. We kind of know where to go. So I'm just going to hire like a sales team and help and get them to figure it out. And then once we have customers, right. then, we'll, then we'll invest in marketing, right? That's usually how it goes. And we did it the other way where we're like, okay, day one, marketing, okay. You know, and, they, and I was marketer number one at SuperSide. So they <laughs> hired me, not anybody yeah. else. They hired me as the VP of marketing and said, here's a budget, build up a small, like high-performing team. So we only, I, I think I only hired two people in the first year. So it was a team of three and we relied on some consulting and some agencies and whatnot, but team of three, but huge amount of leverage and faith in marketing. And then when we had some customers come through the door after the first four or five months, then we invested in building a sales motion. We had a PLG only approach and then we slowly moved over to a sales led approach where everything had to go through a sales team. We actually found that to be a lot more efficient, believe it or not. And now we have so much inbound and all of this stuff that the machine's just like doing its magic. And now we're investing in ABM and PLG again. So, so yeah, so just to summarize, like huge investment in faith and marketing from day one, (laughs) which then kind of led to this just general notion of like being just efficient on everything. Like we just are obsessed with efficiency, both from a customer perspective, like how we offer value to our customers Mm -hmm. and help them save cost and time and whatnot and, and plug into their feedback loops. But also in terms of how do, what is our our go-to-market and how do we create that efficiency? And that's, that's been refreshing. I don't, I don't think I've ever been at a company where we're having these kinds of higher level conversations and have this level of clarity and alignment across the board, across the exact team. Right. It's, it's, it's cool too, that you had that investment in marketing early on. And I mean, was there any trick to getting buy-in for that or was it? Yeah, no, I, I fortunately no trick because our CEO is like, I'd say like half economist, half marketer himself. <laughs> and so he didn't, he didn't need convincing, you know, he was already convinced. Right. Like he put out this, like, that was my question when I was interviewing at this company, I was just like, it's kind of a little bit unusual to like your first hire to be like a VP of marketing. And right. he was very clear. He was like, no, nope, we're going to invest in marketing. And I want this person to come in and figure out what, where, where to invest. He was like, I don't know. I have some ideas, but I don't know. So I want this person to figure it out. So we could do this. We could do content marketing. We could play the SEO game. We could do paid. It was just like, you figure it out. So, so that was, yeah, that was, so, so no tidbit. I think the only thing that I'll say is if you have the choice, if you are in a good position where you can have a pick of the kind of company you choose to join as a VP mm-hmm. marketing or what have you, if you have that ability, it's so much better if the person you're reporting to and just the bench in general, the exec bench in general gets marketing. It's very hard to find in B2B, although things are much better now, but if they get marketing or get growth, that makes things way easier, just clears the path for you to just be like a lot more experimental and take some moonshots and, and all of that type of stuff. Yeah. So tell me about the moonshots, the concept of that. I mean, you've got SuperSide as the company, you've got SuperSpace is the space that you go into. And now we've got moonshots. What are moonshots? How do you do that? Oh my gosh, I didn't even realize all of the space analogies. Yeah. Um, and we talked about symmetry and string theory in the first <laughs> exactly. um, Yeah, no, moonshots is, I just, I, I just use that term because it kind of distinguishes, just to take a step back, marketing, I just feel like rough, like, if you really zoom out, it's just, just no one really knows how 
things are going to work out, how things are going to sell, where you're going to find product market fit. Like you can't predict that. Like you have some hypotheses and you just have to like see it through. So if you zoom out, marketing is just a series of amazing experiments and hopefully with a high hit rate, right? That That's it. It's like a series of experiments that you've strung together somehow. And some of those experiments just have to be gigantic bets. And those bets are, is really what I call moonshots. And a moonshot, the reason I use the term moonshot is because it's, it's a long shot. It's far away that the moon is far away, right? So it's a, it's a long shot. It may or may not work out. And you're okay with that. Getting alignment from everybody involved that and the CFO included, because that's where the budget's going to go, is that there's a high chance that this quote unquote moonshot will fail. And we need agreement on what is success and what is failure and what, under what circumstances do we continue investing and trying and trying again? That is what I call a moonshot. So I'll just give you an example of that. Uh, I mean, there's tons in, in my time at Superside, but one of the early things we realized, I think in 2021, was that in order for us to continue growing, actually, there was like one key insight. We found that the LTV and just like the general quality of the revenue was a lot, lot, lot better when we sold to enterprise customers versus mid-market and SMB customers. And we had a feeling that that would be the case, but it hadn't been proven out in data just yet. And we didn't know how much better that was. So the enterprise customer would yield something like 3x in terms of MRR and would have infinite expansion opportunities. So not even looking at expansion, the MRR. So the retention curve was amazing. MRR was amazing. Everything was good. So we were just like, okay, this is way better than we thought. So okay, enterprise is probably where we want to go. That's the name of the game. We're not going to change the business overnight, but we need to crack some enterprise accounts. At that point, we had very few enterprise accounts. We had like Hmm. Shopify, Salesforce, Amazon. There was a few, you know, there weren't, there weren't Cloudflare. There weren't like that many. So we're like, okay, let's, let's grow this pile. And how do we actually do that? And one of the moonshots we came up with was, should we do like the more like traditional ABM approach? And I had seen it work really well at one of the companies I used to be at a few years ago before I joined Superside. And in fact, it worked so well that we had almost entirely pivoted to ABM at that company. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I've kind of done it before. I think there's something here. At the very least, it's a forcing function to like really go hard in a certain segment, like whether that's like enterprise in tech or enterprise in financial services. Like we had a couple of hypotheses. And I was like, you know what, if it doesn't work out, we'll just try again. And if it still doesn't work out, then maybe this, just, maybe it's not for us and we'll, we'll figure it out. So what we did is we, I had this conversation with our, at that time, our VP of sales and our, and my boss, the CEO, and we said, Hey, let, let's try this thing. Let's build a small ragtag team, like a BDR function or governed by somebody very tightly connected to demand, our demand gen function. So they're actually the same function, demand gen and ABM are under the same person, the same roof. Uh, we hired a director of demand gen that year. And yeah, we just built this ragtag team. It was like one BDR manager and like four BDRs. And we had no tooling. We had nothing. So we just, we bought on some intent data tooling. We bought on like a way to like construct cadences, et cetera. So we mm-hmm. bought Sixth Sense and, and Sales Loft and put them together. And we said, let's just, let's just try this. Let's go look at intent data. Let's pick our accounts. Let's go after them in a, in a way. We'll test our messaging. We'll do all of the stuff and, and see if something lands and let's see what happens. And the early data was not very encouraging. It's not like we were booking meetings out of the wazoo. And I think there was like some, dis, some disheartened people, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But what we did see was that accounts that were showing intent, that they were in fact coming to our site. Even if they didn't book the meeting, they were mm-hmm. coming to our, we were able to like, slowly right. bring them in. So we were like, okay, that's a small win. Like these people are at least becoming aware of us. Maybe the right people are kind of like, Ooh, who is this? You know, maybe right. some referral will come out of it, whatever. We'll keep, we'll keep observing. So we kept investing and we booked like a few meetings and those mm-hmm. are our conversion from the booked meeting to a closed one was incredibly high, like almost a hundred percent, like close to a hundred percent. And in the, it was very small numbers, right? It's like two meetings a month kind of thing. Right. right. But 
those two meetings were turning into closed deals. So we were like, okay, that's, and that's cool. And let's like the whole, the team was paying for itself and more. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't a very costly endeavor. So we were like, okay, let's invest a bit more. So we grew the team a little. And then we were like, let's put some more marketing message <laughs> behind it. Like let's actually create custom content. Da, 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 da. And then it just like started paying off and paying off and paying off. And now like from fall of 20, so October, 2021. And now it's like May, 2023. Our team is 24 BDRs three BDR managers, and there's still tons and tons of room to grow and tons of stuff to figure out that we haven't, but it's like yielding really good results. I just saw on our deals channel today, we landed Crocs. <laughs> <with where I'm laughs> Amazing. Right, now. <laughs> right. Which is like yeah. hilarious because we've been, and it just, it was such, like, when I followed the deal cycle, it was so easy. It was so simple. Like, mm. like we just, we've just gotten so good at identifying the champions and looking at the signals <laughs> and saying the right thing to the right people. So this is a repeatable motion, but look how long it took to actually get to this place. Right. right. And that, that work, the DNA of the company needs to be such that they are willing to invest in something that has some wins under its belt and see that thing grow. And if you can get agreement early on about what success looks like, or, or like, even if they're small signs of success, that's, that's a moonshot to me. And, yeah. and it requires everybody to be in lockstep. Like, for example, the sales team is closing the deals, but if they were like naysayers on, oh, well, what the ABM thing is stupid or, or like the leads that the, the, the team is booking for me are not good. The meetings are not good. Like if they had this attitude, there's absolutely no way that it would have worked. But the fact that we were all aligned from day one, sales, marketing, CEO, product, all of us were aligned. It, it makes, a lot of, makes a lot of sense. So that's an example. I love it. I love it. And I mean, it's... Um... Fortitude comes to mind, right? The fortitude to keep pushing forward, to look for those small wins or signals that says there's something here. There's there's something worth continuing to push forward. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And there's there's absolutely days that you have to call it as well. Like uh, mm-hmm. we invested in a, like coming, taking it back to the community conversation we had, we were like, oh, you know, we've done a good job somewhat accidentally on our brand and community building and people love Superside. And there's a lot of fans out there of Superside. So we were like, we should tap into that. Why don't we build a space, like a community space where everyone mm-hmm. can hang out and all of this stuff. So we built that and we launched that in the fall of last year. And it's a ghost town. Like no one comes in there, no one does anything, right? So that's an example of a moonshot that also failed. And that's okay. You have to call it. Like we called it. We were just like, shut it down today. Like this is not working. (laughs) And we'll try again. That's cool. Exactly. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's testing and learning basically. I mean, yeah. and, and keeping learning from mistakes as well as what's what's working. I think a lot of times we don't hear about the mistakes, right? Like we, they disappear into the, the, uh, the background and, and no one ends up talking about them, but they're just as important as the wins. Oh. Well, I know I want to transition a little bit because like you're like where Superside is, is kind of at this nexus of like, design and creative and operation and trying to figure out like how to make that work. How should marketers or marketing groups be thinking about design and creative operation? That is actually, yeah, you made a very poignant, yeah. I, I, the nexus is a great comment. I think that, I think that companies that are of a certain size think a lot about operations. Like Amazon comes to mind, like they're super, super, I mean, their whole business in some ways you could argue is like operations. So they're extremely operations focused. They're, they think a lot about efficiency and like how, how we think about it is there's a famous uh, McKinsey report, I think that came out in something like 2012. Like it's been a while, it's like 10 years old almost. And what they found was that only 40% of designers and creatives in any setting, no matter what setting, work on design and creative. Only 40% of their time is actually design and creative. And the rest of the time is like pitching, triaging, bullshit, comms, this, that, like all sorts of stuff, you know, yeah. that tooling, oh, you know, whatever, Photoshop is down. I mean, just making up a silly example, just stuff like that. And so really, like, if you think about it in productivity terms, just to be, not to take it back to the factory days, but if you just... If you just think about, hey, what is this person's expertise and what do they actually spend their time on? They're not spending time on the thing that they're experts at. So one of the ways that SuperSide thinks about that is how do we, we, like, this is part of our product and service development. Like, how do we 
create a great subscription service that takes away all of this bullshit away from the creative, both empowers our own creatives on our team because we're like, we have have a little bit of AI, but we're mostly people powered. And how do we also transfer that same to our customers? How do we get those teams to be more productive and and producing a lot more and have driving great outcomes through the creative that they're, that they're making. And so we, we think about this design operations or creative operations thing, thing a lot, just like DevOps, you know, engineering teams have ops teams, DevOps teams. If you're a large enough engineering team, you might have a separate DevOps group entirely. This, this was pioneered quite a while ago, but design ops or creative ops is the exact same thing, except it's very much dedicated to the, to the design team. It's so big that, and you know, Airbnb is a great example of this. If you just Google Airbnb design ops, they have a whole website even dedicated to that. They've built a separate design ops department that is not inside the design department, their centralized creative team. That's a separate team and they work, they both work in parallel and they both have different missions and mandates. So, you know, if you're launching a new campaign, yeah, like the ideation and the execution and all of that stuff will come down to like their, their creative function that they manage internally. But then this design ops function that's built around them is basically clearing the path for them. Um, to be able to do that. And that includes data gathering, any kind of triaging of who's doing what, budgeting, planning of resources, and all of their sprints, all of that stuff, that team takes care of all of the tooling, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's, I think, really, really, it's an important way for people to think about scale. And a lot of companies, I think a lot of our big enterprise customers have design ops people or teams. And actually one just random tidbit, which I found fascinating was one of our customers is Intercom, which if you are, if you're listening and you're from tech, everybody knows Intercom and Intercom has been around forever. And I remember from the early days as a marketer, like everyone admired their brand so much and the consistency of their creative across every little thing that they did. Lo and behold, they're a customer of ours. And I was just interviewing one of the power users there for something, I forget what it was. Oh yeah, it was like a contribution to this um, guide that we were writing. And she said, guess how many people on our design team? I was like, I don't know, like 50. And she was like, nope, 14. I was like, you're 14. She was like, one of them's ahead of design and four design ops people on that team. And then the rest are designers. Wow. That's a crazy ratio. Like normally it's like one design ops person for a team of like 30 or something. It's something crazy. Right. right. And so they had four design ops people and, huh. and then the designers and, and then this head of creative. And I was like, why? And she was like, this is why this we've built this amazing flywheel. We produce so much and we know exactly how it's impacting um, marketing and our downstream metrics because they did work for product and they did work for marketing. So it kind of mm-hmm. made sense. Right. And she was like, we, the four of us figure out, she was a design ops person herself. She's like, the four of us figure out who's doing what, what work are we farming out to Superside? What needs actually like a very specialist freelancer? What work is our team doing in-house? What are the timelines for that? How does that all intersect? And like, and she's like, we just create this amazing feedback loop for how our creative team understood like what was actually performing and what wasn't, which is a very big part of good creative mm-hmm. production. Like how right. do you know what to make if you don't know how it performs? So you just fly in blind. So yeah, that was, that was an amazing insight and story like that you could be like extremely high output, high, high performance creative team if you mm-hmm. invest in the operational components of it. Right. I mean, I, I think it just goes to the notion of that stat you said that 40% of the time is not actually spent on designing and you can suck that away. The amount of creative output that you could get <laughs> could go way up. Not to mention that like, If you've got all the other stuff bearing down on you, if you're a designer or a creative, I have to believe as somebody that has some of that stuff laying around every once in a while that like it's not the most creative stuff and it's not the most inspiring and probably is impacting the creative side of what I need to be doing anyway. 100%. Uh, Yeah. And there's there's different stratas of design work, right? There's like mm -hmm. the ideation piece and like the actual creative concept. Then there's like the campaign design and how everything ties together. And then I call it like the execution layer. Some people Mm -hmm. call it production, but I don't think it's quite production. It's just like the assets that you need to execute that could actually determine the the fate of the, the campaign's performance. And it requires like different levels of thinking and sort of like everything requires like a different space. Like you're coming up with the concept of a campaign. Mm -hmm. You might need more breathing room and space to like iterate and think through that 
Whereas the execution piece might actually happen really fast, but you could, you might need to create like three different versions. Anyway, all this is, all this is like well-documented, well-understood, and yet somehow companies don't quite structure their marketing design creative teams in that way to like facilitate these kinds of conversations. Mm. Uh, So our hope is that for the selfish desire that we fulfill for our customers is, can we help instill some kind of, not to overuse the word, but workflow or process Mm -hmm. that allows them to get the most from, from their teams and their vendors and their partners. Right. It makes me think about the, um, I think it's a South African proverb that I've heard recently used, which is uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm. I think there's something there. You think of it, bringing more people to the mix or having you know, operations com- leaders in the mix may slow you down. It, it might in the short term, but in the long term, how much further can you do? How much more effective can you be? Yeah. Interesting, interesting concept. But um, well, it's been fascinating to learn a little bit about the business, about creative and, and operations and how you think about it. One of the things we love to do on this show, though, is to get to know you even a little bit better. And I love my favorite question to ask everyone that comes on is, you know, is there an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Ooh. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the heads up, Alan. <laughs> um, that defines. Ooh. I think someone said at my old company, my CEO, when I was leaving the company to come to Superside, he kind of said, I think he meant it as a compliment, but it came out wrong. (laughs) He was just like, I don't know what I'd asked him. um, Or maybe he was just telling me stuff, but he was like, he was like, uh, he's like this like extremely nerdy engineering guy, basically. And sometimes he has a hard time with words. I can say that aloud because everyone knows this about Mike, but he said something like, you're, you're like a chameleon. You can adapt to any situation or I'm paraphrasing, but he used the word chameleon. And I was like, chameleon, I don't want to be a chameleon. That's a diss that I, I don't, I don't think of myself as a chameleon, but mature Amrita, um, now that I'm four years into this job and some of the things that my boss has said to me, makes me think like adaptable and, and a bit resilient. I can definitely like roll with various circumstances and roll with the punches for sure. I mean, this market's been hard. We've had to restructure our team and move, I've, you know, same players have been moved around a little and we've done that a few times in the last six months, which has been, which has caused a lot of anxiety. And there's just like a lot going on in the world right now, et cetera. And I feel like part of the reason I think I was able to, or that I I'm okay with this. And I just assume change is like, in my mind, it's always wartime. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not like a peacetime CMO type. Like it's, it's always wartime. You should always be anticipating. You should always be looking ahead. It's always shit is going to hit the fan. Like I just mm-hmm. assume that that's the case. And I think if I put my psychologist hat on, it's because my dad was in the military and we mm-hmm. moved around every two or three years. So change was like absolutely inevitable. Like Absolutely. I had to make new friends. I had to like, I mean, just like uprooting and moving, uprooting and moving and uprooting, moving. And you just become okay with change. You just become okay Mm -hmm. with just like being discombobulated all the time. I love that. I love that story and the the experience and the the fact that you're okay with the chameleon comment now. I think that's (laughs) the most important. I think it's in a good way. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think (laughs) so. I think it's a a definitely an advantage if you're adaptable. Yeah, know, to various situations. To the environment. Yeah, I yeah. think that's what he meant. I'm not an yeah. act because I think in English, <laughs> at least, chameleon is like someone who changes their color, and you can't tell yes. who they are, and they're duplicitous, right? That's how we, I think, we think about it in the Western world. But yeah, yeah and I think he had a more Eastern brain. Yes. Yeah. No, that makes sense. It makes sense. Well, what advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this journey all over again? Yeah, that one's an obvious one for me. It's. Honestly, I think you've heard this from lots of people, but yeah, take more chances, be more experimental. I think I, I always had this like idea. And when, like, like when I was in that lowly marketing specialist at that first tech job I had, I just thought everything had to be perfect. Like I was so obsessed with, you know, having a high win rate on everything I did. And like, this had to be successful. And like, I'm not going to be the one who's <laughs> owning this program that like, or whatever it was, right? Like it had to be. And, and it's just like, that obsession is helpful sometimes, but I think it kind of closes you off to other ideas and opportunities and other ways of doing things. 
because you're obsessed with the wrong thing. You're obsessed with success and not obsessed with learning. And you're not obsessed mm-hmm. with velocity of learning, um, which right. is something I've learned at Superside. Well, speaking of learning, is there anything that you're trying to learn more about right now or you think marketers need to be learning more about? Oh my gosh, there's so much. It's like, uh, it's exactly like, I don't know what's happened, but I think this is in every profession, but maybe marketers are bearing the brunt of it right now. But like the world's changing like every year, right? Every six months to a year. Mm -hmm. Like, look how AI has taken over the conversation and like people are figuring out all these neat use cases and whatnot. I think the real... The thing that I think marketers have to look out for in every facet of their work is just this idea of dilution. Mm. I think everything can drown in a sea of sameness and just like <laughs> look and feel the same and sound the same, Yeah. Uh, particularly as we start using AI more and more. And there's just no turning back. Absolutely. It's going to be a fabric of how we work today. So that's mm. going to happen. But yeah, I think we need to be cautious about same sameness and dilution and find ways to not let that happen across right. everything. Yeah. Well, and I think to your point, I think as more technology comes online and the fact that we might be using the same inputs, the same tools, the risk of becoming the same increases exponentially. Yeah. Um, and it, it does, it does create, you know, with great, with great power comes great, great responsibility, right? So it's it'll be interesting to watch the evolution of those things. Yeah, well, yeah. But like uh, having a, I think like having a cheat sheet for yourself mm-hmm. and for your team, right, would be helpful. Like I'm trying to think about like what are what is the general checklist we should run through every time before we like launch anything to the world. What what are the things that what are the key ingredients that we can't lose sight of? Right. Oh, is our brand promise coming through? Whatever, whatever those things are, right? It's different for every company. But yeah, having having that top of mind, I think, will be helpful. And it's it's so funny because this like we always say like the pendulum constantly keeps swinging back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. It's like it used to be the Mad Men days, then it became super <laughs> data led. Now we're kind of data informed, but not fully data led. And now like, I feel like some of it's like swinging backwards because it's like, oh yeah, maybe there's some good stuff from the Mad Men days, like this Mm -hmm. idea of like being unique and standing out and whatever. So yeah, I guess this is like the constant struggle of marketing back and forth and back and forth (laughs) and problems are constantly being retermed and and whatnot. Well, last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? Good question. I kind of feel like I answered that to some degree with this previous Mm -hmm. conversation. I think, I think there's like one more interesting thing that's happening, which is we've got like a proliferation of like data at our hands Mm -hmm. and our fingertips. Although arguably some of it's going to be because of privacy and all of the lockdowns that Google and Apple and all these guys are doing, like maybe it's not quite as, maybe the data isn't quite as good anymore or won't be as good anymore. But I think that finding, I think the art and science of finding signal in the noise is somewhat lost. I speak with a lot of young, early in their career marketers, just sometimes just having coffee chats and whatnot. And I think everyone has this expectation. I shouldn't generalize, not everyone, but I think there is this expectation in general that, oh, I can just find this data, my first party data, or I can find the answer to this question. And I think like nothing really has prepared us to find the signal and the noise and actually like talk to real people and find the patterns from the kinds of things that they're saying. I'm kind of rambling a bit, but like a concrete example of that is, you know, I've been doing these like classic win-loss calls with all our Mm -hmm. customers. I've taken over that effort. My first, I just personally do every single win-loss call. I do like at least two a week kind of thing. And like, it's hard because like every different people say a lot of different things. And I write stuff down as fast as possible and try to see the patterns in it. And Mm -hmm. I used to be really good at it. And I feel like I have lost the ability (laughs) to do that, to find the signal in the noise, you know? And so I'm creating a system for myself where I can kind of like see that come through. And, but yeah, like uh, until recently, I wasn't even doing those calls. And so who's doing those calls? How's the data coming through? It's left up to the, that person's judgment. judgment. 
right you know, surfacing yeah. what's important to the company and some of these things are big big things of how people think about mm-hmm. us and how they found us and how they made their decisions and what the decision tree was like this is important meaty information and we're losing so much of this because oh we have data we know how this customer went. <laughs> i always look at the sales notes or i just listen to the gong right. call or it's like no there's other types of call data that you're not capturing and like mm-hmm. you need to capture that and you need to connect the dots of that so i think part of that's lost. I'm trying to rebuild that myself. Um, hopefully anyone listening will start paying attention to that. I love it. I love it. Well, Amrita, thank you for coming on the show and, and spending time with us. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today. And you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Mark.